Listen, it's been such a joy. Um, I'm, I'm having the time of my life, and I never felt this way before. No, that was a film. Um, <laughs> I'm having a time of my life. I really am. And I am... Yeah, you're waiting for me to... Um, I'm back. Um, this is amazing. And, uh, you know, Phil, uh, um, when I'm here, I completely, uh, totally submit. Uh, I mean this uh, un- under your authority. And uh, just, uh, I love the anointing on your life and just the apostolic for what you're doing. And uh, listen, don't ever apologize if you're listening to you. I don't need to preach. Um, I would quite gladly sit there and listen to the revelation that God gives you. Um, never feel, I, I, if you would have said, Andy, you're not preaching tonight, I would have said, that is so more than fine. Because there's an anointing on your life that, that opens things up. And uh, just love you guys so much and just can't stop saying that. And uh, yeah, awesome. So hey, everybody enjoying the life of the vine? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being having a sip every day? Yeah. Well, that's not what you're meant to do. You're meant to stay joined. Now, I'm hoping that we've got enough semi-educated people to, to realize the three words were remain in him. Thank you. Good. That settles a lot in my mind. Um, listen, all we're called to do is remain in the vine. That's it. We're called to remain in the vine and, and we're called to join others to it. Um, religion judged people when they had no ability to change or transform. And Jesus is bringing us back to a message that offers people um, transformation, not modification. And, you know, what churches have done for years is they've judged the people coming through the doors in the condition they're in. But it's not their fault because they've not yet been joined to Christ. And we, we've got to grow up and, and judge ourselves correctly as those who are joined. And recently in church, I was saying to some of our leaders, because in England, we're getting people come through the doors, you know, when the doors are open uh, again. <clears throat> and we, we got guys coming in, men wearing dresses. Um, and, and we've got uh, people coming in who are confused with their sexuality and, and, and all manner of things. And we've had people say, you shouldn't let them in. Why? They, they need Jesus. They don't need judgment. What needs to happen is we need to join them to the vine and get a beautiful, perfect seal. And that principle carries across Europe or England or Africa. It's the same mission. We don't change people. We don't transform people. He does. His life, his word in his life is what transforms people. And I think religion took the responsibility of of trying to change people. And it just produces suppression and hypocrisy. That's, that's what it produces. People begin to act like you want them or they think you want them to act. God doesn't want to do that. He wants to change them on the inside, you know. Um, I, I say to all our teams in family church, listen, whoever comes through those doors, they get the biggest kingdom welcome uh, beyond anything they ever believed. We're not looking at the flesh. We're not looking at who they are. We're looking at what God's seeing. We're looking at who they're going to be when, when the life of the vine begins to flow through that's what we're looking at and uh you know we had a a young lady come in a few weeks back and um you know it's funny I was walking through the the coffee a few weeks back we've been locked down for six months so it's got to be about eight eight months now um (laughs) and uh and I was walking through the coffee lounge and and I said to this lady hi you're here for the first time because I'm one of these pastors I, I don't float out of a side room during the worship um, you know, it's like sometimes you're like, where did you come from? You know, no, I stand at the door and I welcome everyone coming to God's home. Um, and I love their faces when they see the, the welcomer on the door is the one that's pre That's kingdom. That's Jesus. You know, Jesus is kind. He's nice. He, he, he's gentle. He's, you don't base your opinion of Jesus on, on a moment when he turns tables over. There was a lot more moments when that, when he was just kind, just kind, loving. People couldn't get enough of him. That's the life of Jesus I want in me. And I went up to this young lady and said, hey, hey, good morning. Are you with us for the first time? And her introduction was interesting. She said, hi, I'm a lesbian. I said, I'm Andy. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm so, well, I'm so glad you're here today. Hope you, hope you really in, enjoy this service. And we went into our praise and worship. Two weeks later, I, I, I came to her and I said, hey, how are you enjoying church? She says, 
We need to talk. Everything that was once settled in my heart and inside of me no longer feels right. Can we have a conversation? And I put her onto one of our teams. No one had judged her or preached her. We just connected her to the vine. And we got a good seal. Good seal. And then we begun to see ministry is we coach the life of the vine in people. We don't try to do what only the vine and the life of the vine can do. And again, if you're here today and you know, you're know you struggling with stuff, and that, you, you just got to learn to remain in the vine. It's simple. Honestly, there's this, this lovely old story about um, this, old mine, this old man who had an apple tree in his garden. And it came to the, the time of year when the leaves would leave, fall off, you know, autumn. And uh, he was standing in his kitchen and all the leaves fell off this tree. And one didn't. One stubborn leaf just hung there. And this leaf began to irritate this man. And uh, he began to walk around the garden looking at this leaf and, 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 wait, and it wouldn't fall. So he got a chair and a broom handle <clears throat> and he got on the chair and he, he got on the broom and, and he started trying to swing at this leaf, just expending his en- energy on this leaf. And, and he couldn't reach it. So he got another chair and, you know, that thing that fixes everything, duct tape, and, um, and, and just stuck the chairs together. Another, and he's on there and he's balancing, he's, he's balancing and, 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 and he's, he goes to swing for this leaf and the chairs collapse. He lands on his back and the broom hits him on the head. And it's like the leaf is up there going, <laughs> at him. You know, the leaf is still up there. And as he's laying on the floor, he felt the Lord say to him, why don't you just let the seasons and nature do what nature does? Because it's inevitable that there's going to be life coming up the vine into the branch that will force out that stubborn leaf and replace it with something brand new. We've got to understand sometimes, you know, when I tried to give up smoking, um, Christians didn't help. They really didn't, you know. Smoking was the least of my addictions. But to Christians, it was like the major one. And I started to get real hang up. Like I've got, and I realize now that, that smoking was like number 403 on the list of stuff that God was going to deal with in my life. But the church made it like number one. And I can remember like... Saying people, I'm, I'm believing to give up smoking. Or they'd see you smoking, they'd go, another nail in your coffin? Thank you, that really empowered me <laughs> to change. <laughs> or someone else, another Christian would go, the cigarette smokes itself, you're the sucker on the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Feeling mighty. Jesus is so kind. When the time was right, he just released the sap. It came into the branch. And that leaf fell off. Listen, we're all works in progress. Just, just All I can keep saying over and over again is remain in the vine, remain in the vine. Everything you need, everything everyone else needs is found in that life that's found in the vine is Christ Jesus. Amen. Listen, I've got some stuff I want to, I've got some prophetic stuff on my heart. And uh, um, uh, firstly, I, I, I want to let you know, some, a lot of people have been coming up and saying, uh, have you got any videos? Yeah, we've got loads of fr- stuff that's, that's free. And we've got this link if we could pop it up. Because um, I keep trying to tell people. Um, there's a link there. And, and if you go to that link, it's everything. It's podcasts. Um, movies, um, devotionals, um, it, it's everything, and, and, and just go help yourself. Um, so there, if we could pop that up at the end, maybe, when the meeting's done. That one, link tree, um, is all of my stuff, Facebook, Instagram, pods, books, and, and all that stuff. Okay, so is that okay? Because lots of people, can we see video? It's all on there. It's free, okay? Um, I was really inspired today um, by just all the ministry, and I'm just loving doing life with, with everyone that's here. And I was really inspired, you know, by, by all the messages, but also how you, you, you just boasted in your family. So I'm going to do that. I don't do that enough. Normally I get in and I don't even introduce myself. I, really seriously, if you, if you watch conferences, I get up and, say, and I get straight in the word. And, and I'm like afterwards, like, oh, I don't know if they knew who I was, you know. Um, so here is my family. This is, <coughs> that's Ethan. He's six foot six. Uh, you'll hear more about him later. Um, and there's all my princesses and stuff like that. Um, 
that is my pack. Um, but I have another family. Would you like to see my other family? Here we are, pop them up. Um, <laughs> I never thought I would hang out with lions. Never. Never. I have a saying in my life, and uh, this really took it to another level. The saying is, oh, I don't do fear. Mm. This one, there were moments. <laughs> there were moments. Now, now, I've got something prophetic to do with this. I'm not just boasting in that I am the lion whisperer now. <laughs> my pack, my girls, they call me chubby blue-eyed one. <laughs> chubby blue-eyed one and I'm one of theirs now you, you guys know you were there now when we went to see the lions it was interesting and this is really for those who are AMT students and anyone wanting to be a part of the pack that's overland when I was going through this moment of, of finding my, my lion family and they wanted to hold me up and everything they did they, did, they, wanted, they, they wanted me to walk with them to a cliff and hold me up with a baboon. And it was a, my imagination for it just doesn't stop. It's busy in here. Now, anyway, um, it was amazing. We, all, we, all, we had no idea we were going to do this, did we? We went there and said, hey, do you want to walk with lions? And I'm like, I think, oh, yeah, you, you're a very funny man. And then they meant it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, kind of, we're up for it and everything like that. And we go there and we meet the soldiers. And, and, and I'm thinking, how are we going to like, stay safe here? And if you've ever been there, they give you a stick. <laughs> and, and it's that long. They give you a stick. He said, help yourself to a stick. I was like, what, an AK-47 or something? A, a stick. And I got my stick and I was like, oh, that's all right then, isn't it? That's okay. We're good. And and they said later on you're going to walk with you're going to walk with lions. Would you like to see a clip of me walking with lions and the guys? Here we go. Pop this up. This is brilliant. It's me and my girls and a few friends just going out. If there was noises, you'd hear <laughs> as we were walking. There's the girls, and they went off, and I, yeah, they wanted to take me to the moment where they lifted me off the cliffs and all that stuff, but isn't that great? Now listen, here's, here's, in this I could really feel God speaking about some stuff for me back home, but also for, off of the back of that in, incredible message by Martin this morning, that if you want to wanna walk with lions, and that's why you're here, these, these, guys, are, these guys are lions, if you want to walk with lions, you've got to understand there's an etiquette. You don't just walk into the pack and go, hello, everyone, I'm in now. <laughs> they will bite your face off. <laughs> and as I heard this morning, so will Martin. 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 Or Martin, as it's spelled in England. So I'm here and I'm like, Lord, surely you're speaking in this moment. Because I've got a selfie with me and a kangaroo. That's hot. I could put that one up tomorrow. I was in Australia and I just got right next to a kangaroo and went, it, 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 he could have ripped my head off. But I don't do fear. Now, when we were there, I'm, I'm saying, we're saying in regards, you know, you've got that kind of, to me, whenever I get nervous, it comes out in humour. Or tears. Or both. I was a tad nervous, especially when Phil said to me after, oh, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> hmm. And I'm saying to the guys, I'm saying to the guys, I'm saying, has anyone died? <laughs> Ever. <laughs> this week. <laughs> no. No one's died. <laughs> and then I said to the guard, remember, I said, I love you. And I said, oh, I love you. <laughs> Holding my stick. <laughs> I love you. Love you. 
And then there came the moment they said, and this is what really God spoke to me about. And I, I really felt to share this tonight. There's an etiquette. You don't just walk with lions. That brilliant scene at the end where we're all there kind of, and we're, we're all walking along, oh, one more way, oh, one more way. I mean, we're just, we're just going, <laughs> Right now, that doesn't just happen. The lions. It, no, no, no. But God, right? Oh, it's all right. It was all in the act. Here for a week. Now, um, but God said, I said, I don't think I've ever listened to instruction as much as this. I said, what do we do? And I said to him, listen, let's start at the, at the, at the, the key bits. I said, Please tell me, because they look quite calm now, the absolute last thing I should do. And he looked at me and he said, if you start running, they will hunt you down and kill you. (laughs) That made me feel a lot better, you know? Because sometimes you run and you don't know you're doing it until you're running and you're like, this was one of those moments that couldn't happen, but I don't do fear. But boy, was the spirit of fear shopping for me that day. <laughs> didn't open the store, didn't let him in. But then they started to say, they said, they said right, no, this is how it's going to walk. You don't just walk with lions. And I want to say this to AMT and to those coming. You don't just walk with lions. There's an etiquette that you need to understand. It's a kingdom etiquette. And there were so many similarities here. And, and, and the guy who I loved very much, he, he said to me, and he, he taught us a team, he said, What you do first, before they let you walk with them, you don't just walk with lions. You've got to become a part of the pack. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is this going to look like? I'm having like this Ace Ventura moment, the hippo. uh, 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 What what are they going to make me do? I've never watched anything on walking with lions. I'd imagine me in their arms. What are they going to make me do? I'll do it. <laughs> and they said, you've got, you've got to go behind them, all right? And, and it just got better and better. You've got to go behind them, but you've got to really snuggle in. <laughs> they said, don't worry. I said, there's a big male lion on its own. It says, no, no, the, the, the women are the vicious ones. They're the hunters. I was like, have you got any cats? And, and, and so you had to, and we all had to do this, it was amazing. You, 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 you came in behind, and you had your stick, which is just incredible confidence with that. <laughs> incredible. And I found prophetic stuff for a lot of this, but the stick I'm still kind of working on. I think it must be a firebrand. Because they said, when they get feisty, put it in their mouth. <laughs> put the chewed end in their mouth. And, you know. And so... We had, to, we, had to, we had to come in behind, like walking behind, like there's, there's three lions here, right? And, and you walk in behind, and they're saying, closer, closer. I'm like, <laughs> and I get in, and lower. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Slap its bum. <laughs> right? If you tickle it, it won't like it. (laughs) You like that? (laughs) I'm kneeling there, slapping its bottom. And it's going... uh, Is it... Don't touch its head. It doesn't like that. Good with that. Fine with that, really. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Cha-cha. And apparently, as I'm doing this, I'm becoming a part of the pack. They're, they're, they're sitting there going, nice. You know. <laughs> it's, hey, it's Andy. Andy's here. Blue Eye Fat Boy is here. Makatangi, he's here. And so we all do that. And they it seemed, and then they said, they said, now they will walk with you. I'm like, I'm, they look comfortable. 
And they all start getting up. And we're, I'm like, okay, we're walking, we're walking. We're closer. We're wa- You've got to be a part of a pack. And so we're walking hip to hip with them. Like, <laughs> Man, Maddie got slapped around the face with a towel twice. <laughs> it was beautiful. Cause my up my lightning scales. I just like <laughs> Oh and we're walking with these lions like and it was incredible. I never in my life thought I'd walk with lions. But after a while you're like, okay, all right. Me and the girls, and then they turn around, you go, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. Now listen, here's some lessons I learned from this. <laughs> Whew. I felt I felt the Lord saying if you want to walk with these lions, you've got to understand kingdom protocol. That you can't just come in and, and come in with familiarity. That that's not kingdom. Familiarity. I wrote a couple of things down here. Number one, you've got to come with a posture of submission. Before we could walk with them, we had to demonstrate the posture of submission. But we were not in charge. They were in charge. We were not leading. They were leading. And when we came with a posture of submission, the next bit of advice he gave me, he said, you never touch their mind. And what came through my mind was the touch of familiarity. I want to warn you, never get familiar. You walk with giants. You walk with legends. Don't ever make that just another day. Don't ever lose that kingdom mystique, that, that, that familiarity. Don't let, it, don't let it cause you to reach out and touch these lions in a way that you shouldn't. Keep a submission in your heart. Keep away from, from reaching forward. And the other lesson I really learned was they're leading, you're not. Because the guard told us nicely, because I said, do you think they'd like me to take them for a walk? You know, should, I, should I pop in front? They said, they will kill you. <laughs> okay, let's forget that one. <laughs> Listen, the leadership of this house is prophetic and it's visionary. And you follow their lead. I don't care about an unaccountable, unhonorable society that's called life. This is kingdom. This is kingdom. And if you want to do well in AMT... Know the posture of submission, not for entry level, but all of your days. And you will walk with lions. You will walk with lions. You will walk with lions to nations you've never been. Never cross the line of familiarity. And always take your place in walking with them. Another lesson I learned, they said never fall back. Never fall back. The moment you fall back, it uneases the lions and causes them to begin to look back and become distracted. Stay tight. And I just think there's some real good lessons in there for people that want to walk with lions. I began to translate that concerning my walk with Aslan. Because one of the enemies of the modern world is familiarity with God. They no longer pursue God to be who he is, but who they want him to be. They no longer want to ascend the hill of the Lord with pure hearts and clean hands to find a God that would take you many eternities to discover any amount of fullness of. Rather, they want to be at the bottom of the hill, fashioning God into what they believe he should be so that they can be convenient in their life. Listen, when we read in Exodus 24 about that, Matt, there's two stances in that regarding how you walk with Aslan. Because let's face it, it's been said many ways that we believe that Jesus is coming soon and we're in the end times. Let me put it in the words of C.S. Lewis. Aslan is on the move. The ground is melting. The ice queen is afraid. And the grass is turning green. Aslan. Oh, see that? That mosquito. You see, it was huge. One hand. You see, the side, you see how massive that was? Could have took out a whole front row of that thing, Sharon. 
Aslan is on the move. <laughs> Listen, we've, we've got to understand. Yeah, I love that picture in Exodus 24. Where in one moment of time, remember, what you give for people that are following you is your pursuit of God. That's the most valuable thing you give anyone that's following you. When you become a lion and a leader and people follow you, you, you owe them above all things your personal pursuit of God. And I want to encourage you, just be like Moses, ever climbing the hill to know his glory more. But isn't it incredible at that moment when he's standing, seeing God in ways he'd never seen him. At the bottom of the mountain, people were melting their earrings. And this is so representative of today's society. Melting down their earrings to bring God down to be something that fitted their God want. Listen, God wasn't in that golden idol. Don't make God into idols. Christians make God into idols. One of my favorite writers is is Toza. Because he just uh, articulates so well that God isn't in all your little models that you've made him to be. Amen. I've got one other thing and then I've got some thoughts I need to share tonight. Now this one's going to be so repulsive to you. But something really spoke to me the other day when, when you were flipping out on, on live on TV. <laughs> when you were talking the other day about ripping the mask off, I felt the Spirit of God say to me, yeah, okay, we can take these off. But there's other people here that are wearing masks because you don't think people will like who you are. There's people that are wearing masks because they don't believe in their heart that God will love them for who they are. And tonight, God wants you to take that mask and he wants you to throw it in the grave of the old creation. The mask does not belong to the new creation. And I felt the Lord put on my heart that there's not just ladies, but men here today. And you don't feel you can be who you really are. Because you don't think people will love you or accept you. So you live behind a projection that makes you safe. But keeps people from knowing you. Listen, I believe God's saying tonight, and your friends are, mask off. Mask off. God loved you before you saw yourself in a mirror. His love isn't based on any projection on what you do. His mind's made up about you. But not just for AMT, but for others here. But you go to bed. I just sensed in my heart, some people will go into bed at night and they're saying, I wish I could be me. But people won't like me. I want to say you're wrong. The life of a vine in you. How could that ever produce anything that wouldn't be liked? I don't want you to come forward. I want you to receive this in your chair right now <clears throat> by a simple decision that God sees in your heart. Tonight, I believe there's about 14 people, specifically. And you know, the Lord's already been speaking to you. It's time for your mask to come off because the world needs to see your face. The world needs to see how awesome God made you. The world needs to see your color. You know, religion makes everything so beige, so magnolia. God makes rainbows. If if religion made fish, there'd be like one fish. Cod. Oh, there's another cod. Yet God makes fish of such colors and extravagance, but live in such depths some have never seen. You know? Like if man made butterflies, a green one. Yet God makes butterflies so beautiful with colors that are just magnificent. God made you magnificent. God made you unique. God doesn't want you to project something that you think people want to see. see this is speaking to someone I know because God put it on my heart. I wouldn't risk my life bringing one of these into this building (coughs) with Phil here. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? Lord, I pray right now 
for anyone that this is speaking to that has become conscious of a mask, a disguise, a protection, not against COVID, Lord, against people knowing them for who they really are. Let the boldness of your Holy Spirit surge through the veins of their personality and their identity. Father, enable them now to take the mask and throw it in the grave of the old creation. That they can begin to breathe, enjoy and smile the authentic reality of who you've made them to be. Father, we thank you in a second for a divine release. A divine release right now. Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, would you turn them to, with me, please, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I thought everybody else was having a go at this, so I, I would have a go tonight. I want to speak to you from my journal, which is my conversations with God. Um, I want to speak to you, not preach at you, rather speak at you. It will probably be a bit of both, so I'm going to spreach at you tonight, okay? Um, but I want to look at something that I heard surfacing in the messages today. And I felt, this is where you want us to go next, Lord. I heard it surface in a couple of the messages. And I said, Father, that's where you want us to take us tonight. And it's, again, it's a rediscovering of something that we can't afford to forget. We've shared over the last couple of days. Let him who says he knows, let him know he doesn't know as he ought. There's so many things that we think we know. But then the Holy Spirit comes in and brings us into an understanding that causes our life to be changed. As it was referred to her, often it's like the Bethesda. I love what Yong E. Chow taught concerning the Logos and the Rhema. He said that the Logos, the word obviously is Logos and Rhema. He said that the Logos can be compared to the water of Bethesda, the spoken word that's always with you. He says... But rhema is when the Holy Spirit stirs the Logos of God. That's where miracles and water walking and supernatural things begin to happen. My prayer tonight is as we look at a subject of something that's been preached for many years, some people that haven't discovered as they should would discover tonight. I want to talk about the kingdom and us understanding we were never meant to be church attenders. Each and every one of us were meant to be a kingdom breaking out in every place we set our feet. I believe that the Holy Spirit is breathing across the church at the moment and he's calling his people to again become kingdom conscious, to walk with a kingdom consciousness that maybe they haven't ever or maybe for many years. I want to speak for Mark. I'm going to use a lot of verses tonight. You won't need to turn there unless you don't trust me and then feel free to. <laughs> Mark chapter 1 in verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, the good news of the kingdom, announcing the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe this gospel, this good news. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. Jesus never preached the good news of atonement. He was the gospel of atonement. The message he shared in every town and village, not recorded once, recorded many times. You see, the kingdom is like What's the example? A red car. Have you ever heard that example? That you don't notice a red car on the roads until you buy one. And then you see it everywhere. A make of Jeep, a, a make of truck. You don't notice them. And then you buy one. And everyone's got one. They always did. Your awareness has just been quickened. The kingdom, you see... It's very similar to that. When the Holy Spirit, which he's going to do tonight for some people, opens your eyes to the kingdom, suddenly you see it everywhere. 
you see it throughout the Gospels. You start to suddenly see that it was the message that Jesus preached. Everywhere he went, he preached, another kingdom is here right now. He preached the presence, not of a new world order, but an original world order, back again on earth. And when he preached the kingdom, people were saved, healed, and the dead were raised. He sent his disciples. Come on, this is important. Again, I've already apologized that everything I preach is super simple. But in my experience, you only ever need a theologian to complicate things. He sent his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And again, there's so many examples. It's what Jesus preached. Stay with me. Just grab the handful. Matthew 13, 45, among other things. Boy, if you want teaching on the kingdom, just read Matthew 13. If you want to see how much Jesus valued the kingdom and what he thought of the kingdom, Matthew 13, if you come out of that, not believing in the kingdom. You read it with your eyes closed. In Matthew 13, let me grab a couple of examples. He says it's the pearl of great worth. He compares it to treasure before that. But then he says there was a man who found a pearl of great worth. You see, everything Jesus was using in comparisons in, Mark, in, 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 in Matthew and other places in the Bible... It was all about the kingdom. That was the subject matter. It was like when you begin to see this, you'll see that Jesus was obsessed with the kingdom. It was in all of his messages. He says it's like a pearl. Somebody found a pearl. And then when they found this pearl, said, nothing else matters. Nothing else I once thought was valuable. Matters to me anymore. I need that pearl. He said it's like yeast and seed. Each of these are a teaching in their own right. He said the kingdom, you see, is like yeast and like seed. It's planted so small in a person. But if it's allowed to germinate, it changes everything. He says my kingdom, it's like, it's like yeast. Again, how small is yeast when it's mixed into the flour? Correctly, it causes everything to rise. You see, the problem is we have so many Christians today who have, who have added the yeast to the flour, the flour being their life, but they've never mixed it in. <laughs> they've never stirred the kingdom into their morality, their finances, their views on things. Nothing's going to rise in your life until the kingdom is mixed in to the flower of everything you are. So many examples. This is my favorite one. <laughs> Another Vaughan verse coming, warning. Luke twelve thirty two. Fear not, little flock. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, anyone that knew Vaughan. I heard him say this for years, but I didn't understand it until the Holy Spirit stirred the waters of Logos and it exploded within me. Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You will never process what's happening in life right now if you don't process it with kingdom perspective. Hebrews 12 Come on, we've read it for years, but we didn't know. It says everything that can be shaken. What, what's the purpose to reveal that which cannot be shaken? My friends, we need to be living kingdom lives, not just singing kingdom songs. The kingdom, you see, first, the kingdom. God. It's a little bit of a tricky catch out one because you get everything if you do that anyway. Seek first the kingdom. And all these things, they're just things. Things. You know, I, I just need a wife. I just, and I take this politely. A wife is a thing. Ah, stop, stop, stop. 
He who finds a wife finds a good thing <laughs> and obtains favour. All the ladies like me again, wham, back. <laughs> and that's how you do it. <laughs> Come on, every, everything else is a thing. Everything. Everything else is a thing. I, ju- I just need money. I, I just need... I just need to, it's a thing. 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 Seek first the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. Do we understand what we're praying when we pray kingdom come? Because <laughs> I, I think... A whole bunch of church don't, you see. It's, we all read that prayer, you know. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Earth as it is on heaven. Your kingdom come. And again, I'm just speaking to you from my journal, which is my conversations with God about stuff. And I asked the question, I said, I wonder what come means in like, in like the strongs and stuff. Because like it's not a big word, is it? Come. Your kingdom come. Because whenever I prayed that growing up in church, it was kind of like this, and it had been taught me this way. It wasn't just my fault. But when I prayed, Lord, your kingdom come, I was praying, God, you up there in heaven, where everything is peekity-boo. No issues. No problem. Me here on earth. Could you come and help me? Could you please come and come and help me? And you see, my understanding of it was wrong, and that was the problem. Because if we understand wrong, we don't live in the good of things. Because when you look at the word come in its original context, it means... In, in one example, it means the coming of something far to another place. But the other three or four contexts or definitions is the manifestation and introduction of something present. What if when we prayed, your kingdom come, we weren't praying, Lord, you up there, come and help me here. But we were actually praying, Lord, give me the manifestation and the introduction of a kingdom that's present here in this situation. This is just the stuff the first century church, the first group of guys knew. You see, the good news, who likes good news? That's why Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. It's not far, far away. It's among us. That would be enough, wouldn't it? But it's also in us. The kingdom is not far, far away, a place that we lift our eyes to try. The kingdom is among us. And it's in us. Missionaries. Do you know that you're carrying a kingdom (laughs) that wants to express itself? You see, Jesus... He brought his kingdom here. We believe that, don't we? We read the Bible. It says that the king was born and and surely we believe in that nativity scene that's so beautiful at Christmas. That the baby Jesus, King Jesus was born. Well, actually, wherever you've got a king, you've got a kingdom. Because the two are synonymous. If you have a kingdom, you have a king. If you have a king, you have a kingdom. What if we dared to change the nativity play to not just see a baby in a manger, but his rule and reign on the earth? One of my favorite definitions of kingdom is rule and reign. When we speak of kingdom, we don't speak of some nebulous, it's his rule and reign. When we acknowledge his kingdom, we're acknowledging his rule and reign over every other rule and reign. You see, Jesus brought his kingdom to earth. And then we know after his death, burial and resurrection, he ascended. And some Christians think he took his kingdom with him. And one day when they die, they'll experience the kingdom. 
because they get confused over the multiple uses of kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and certain things. Listen, my friends, he didn't, he didn't take his kingdom with him. Now think about it. Acts, again, a lot of verses, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Je- Jesus is, is, is talking to his disciples, and it says, after he rose from the dead before he ascended. Now listen, this is his team. This is his team. This is his last instructions, okay, before he ascends. Jesus showed himself to his disciples in unmistakable ways. And then for 40 days, taught them the kingdom. Why would you teach your team 40 days about something you were taking with you? (laughs) You see, he wasn't taking it with him. His kingdom was already in heaven. But now, because of the success of what he achieved on the cross, his kingdom was now present on earth. Not in buildings, in people. You're carrying a kingdom. You're carrying a kingdom. The lions knew it. They took one look at my eyes. Because I'm there and I'm also thinking, Adam told them to back off, so I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I'm a redeemed son of Adam. Those said, sit, give me your paw. <laughs> Looking in their eyes, hoping they would see the kingdom. Okay, everybody good? Yeah. Now, I'm not preaching, and I'm trying to build something, and then we're going to pray, and something's really going to release, I believe. It's going to enhance everything that God's already done in your life. When you were born again, you were born into a kingdom. And a kingdom was born into you. You, you got to believe that. But when you were born again, yes, it was about new birth. Yes, it was about all of the beautiful attributes of new birth. But in that moment when you were born again, you were born into a new kingdom. Come on. You were born into a new kingdom. You became a citizen of a new kingdom. But also, because God never lets us down, a kingdom was born in you. I want to talk tonight about five things. Say five things. Five things. I want to I just want to use these moments to talk about the passageway to seeing the kingdom break out in your life. Anybody like that? Because we could talk about all this stuff, can't we? But the world isn't going to be any better if we just talk about it. So how about we take a journey down a very short, brief passageway together involving five things. Okay, number one, if you're making notes. If you want to move from being a church member, a church, uh, a church attender, to being a kingdom breaking out, It starts with realisation. You need to realise that when you were born again, Colossians 1.13 says it wasn't polite that the Father snatched you out of the kingdom or the dominion of darkness. Come on, we need revelation of this. Things aren't as they were. Everything changed. The moment you were born again, you activated everything Christ achieved for you. And the Father snatched you out of the kingdom of darkness. But he never left you in purgatory or limbo or any other man-made place. He translated you into the kingdom of the son of his love. Oh, Oh, when I die, no, no, now! Now, not when you die, not when you die. When I die, I'm going to heaven. No, 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 now. When you were born again, Colossians declares over you that you were snatched from a dominion of darkness where your father and your ruler was Satan. You were snatched through new birth, the death and the burial and the resurrection of new birth. And you were translated and brought into the kingdom of the son of his love. The Bible recognizes two kingdoms. It's us that make a third one called a place in between. Listen, there is no, there is no grey kingdom. There is no third kingdom. There's the kingdom of darkness to which you were once a citizen. And now there's the kingdom of light of which you are now a citizen. 
But you see, Christians, they like, they like the benefits of two kingdoms. I'll keep one foot in here and one foot in there. Well, Hannah Montana will tell you, you can't have the best of both worlds. Because you never get the fullness of this one, and you never get the fullness of this one. You were once fully in this one, so now come over and be a full-on citizen of the kingdom of the son of his love. It's the power of acknowledgement. Okay, number two. I'm going to make sure I tell you everyone. Some people were a little bit hard in learning. Number one, realization. Number two, the acceptance of your dual citizenship. You see, the Bible declares over us, Jesus said himself, we're in the world. But we're not of this world. Now, it would be kind of stupid to say we're not in the world. Because we really are. But we're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And again, if Christians get this confused, it causes all amount of problems in their life. We're in the world, but we're no longer of the world. We acknowledge our first birth, but we trumpet with our second birth. We fully acknowledge our first birth because we know that God has left us on the earth for purpose. The reason we're on the earth is his purposes. But boy, we need to understand we're no longer of this earth. We're of another kingdom. We're aliens. We're citizens of another place. I got the revelation of this in the American embassy. No, keep it quiet. Some of you are like... Some of the West Virginians were like, come on, here we go. He mentioned the American embassy. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, Shenandoah River. Life is older. Oh, no, stop, stop this nonsense, this nonsense. <laughs> My son, who's six foot six, um, is a dual citizen. Of England and America. All of my kids are entitled to it. Because my wife is an American and, and, and I am British. <laughs> British. <laughs> it's who I am. It's who I am. British. <laughs> no longer in Europe. Thank you. British. <laughs> But all of my children are allowed to be dual citizens, and they have to normally do it by the time they're 18. Ethan was going to study with a, a wonderful ministry called The Ramp, Miss Karen Wheaton. And he was going to do two years there. My daughter, Olivia, had, had studied there as well. And we left it till a week before he was 18. We we're kind of busy, you know. So when people say to me, have you been to Bible school? I'm like, no, I will, I will. I'm just busy now. <laughs> you know? I thought that was funny. Now, it's funny what people think is funny, right? Anyway, so we go to the American Embassy, and I've got Ethan, I've got Jack. We walk in the American Embassy, you see, and the woman didn't even look up at the counter. She thinks I've brought a baby, all right? And I've brought a baby giraffe. <laughs> I took him to the Philippines, and the Philippines vehicles are not built for a baby giraffe. <laughs> we went around the Philippines, and there was legs, like, everywhere. It was amazing. You know, you're feeling that, too, over in the corner, right? I love you. Um, and so we were, they said, have you brought the child with you? And she's scribbling away. Have you? I said, yes, I have. He's right here. And she went. I went That's my baby boy. But this is the lesson that the Holy Spirit taught me as I was crossing into the American embassy. Right. I thought they owned the building. They don't, they, they own the land. The American embassy isn't on British soil. The American embassy owns the soil of what it's on. And this was upset me a little bit, to tell you the truth. <laughs> because everyone else with me had a blue passport. And mine was mauve, because it's British. It's British. 
And when I walked in, my wife and, 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 and my children, they were welcomed. I was searched. <laughs> I'm in London. In Britain. I'm British. And they're treating me like I'm a terrorist. And I'm like, wait a moment. Wait a moment. I've got a purple. I've got a mauve passport. Yeah, get on. Get on. That's not my wall, man. <laughs> you what? <laughs> you what? <laughs> what? <laughs> this side of a gate, I had all the rights and, of a British citizen. But the moment I crossed through into the American embassy, I was now under a new rule and reign. Anything I'd done in Britain did not count here. My life was to be in alignment with the kingdom that I was now in, not the one I'd naturally been born to. Boy, in that moment, I got that revelation. I'm in the world by my natural birth. I'm British. But actually, every natural birth that we represent. See, when we understand this stuff, racism and inequality, it just isn't an issue anymore. You see, the new, I love the song that we often sing, Beneath the Skin, the New Creation. The, the distraction of fighting over epidermis is amazingly deceptive. Because as new creations, we're exempt of those arguments because of our true citizenship. But we are now born again, kingdom citizens of his kingdom. Okay? So we accept our dual citizenship. Number three. This is when things get interesting. We may be citizens, but we're not yet subjects. You can be a citizen of a place, but it doesn't mean you're a subject. A subject is someone who bows their knee to the rule and the reign of the place they now belong. We have got too many people that claim citizenship to the kingdom, but don't live as subjects. You see, the kingdom is rule and reign. Now, we understand in England um, monarchy. Uh, to me, when I, I started, when the Holy Spirit was talking to me about kingdom, it wasn't strange because I'm British. And I understand, I don't understand presidency. I, I understand monarchy, you know. God save the Queen. And I, I love my Queen. I really do. I'm, I'm quite a royalist at heart. You wouldn't guess it, would you? British. Um, you see, years ago, the, the Queen today, she doesn't have rule and reign. She has reign. But the rule has been given to the government. She can still put some shouts in. But generally, the, the, the rule of the country is with Parliament. And we acknowledge the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. But it wasn't like that in the days of, I'm not going to say King Arthur, he wasn't real, was he? Um, Henry VIII, we'll pick him. Henry VIII had rule and reign, which meant when he said something, it was done. When he said, off with their head, it wasn't a debate, the head came off. Because everybody was a subject to the rule and reign of the king. And being subject to the rule and reign of the king made them a, sub a subject of his kingdom. So, okay, realization brings us into the kingdom. We understand our dual citizenship. It's all in the Bible. And we purpose and choose to live as subjects of the kingdom that we now belong to. But we've also now got to decide to live true to the grain of that kingdom. And this is, again, sometimes a breakdown for people that want a place in between. Because, you see, the kingdom has its own kingdom life. The kingdom of God has its own kingdom life. That's often very, very different to the kingdom you came from. And if you try to bring the ways of the kingdom you came from into his kingdom, they will never work. I'm talking about things like forgiveness. I have zero opportunity not to forgive someone. But in the kingdom we came from, oh, you get even, you get a grudge. You, you don't let them get away with it. One day you wait your moment and then tss, you strike. It's one of your noises, wasn't it? Tss. Put that in your repertoire. Tss. You see, in the kingdom of God, we don't live, in this kingdom, we lived by the flow or the grain 
but took us this way. But we've been translated out of this kingdom into his kingdom, and now we live this way. Which means if you're trying to live in the economy of the world you came from, you're going to be broke. But it's not God's fault because in his kingdom, there's a kingdom economy. Just like there's an economy in every kingdom, there's an economy in God's kingdom. And it involves things like tithing, sowing, reaping, generosity, good stewardship. These are kingdom principles that have been in existence before any other kingdom. But it's up to you whether you choose to live by the kingdom principles of the one that you're now joined to. Or you carry on business as usual with the deceptive ones that you came from. If everything's going to be shaken that can be shaken, I want everything that I am in his kingdom. Amen. I want my money in his kingdom. I, I want everything in his kingdom. Because according to Hebrews 12, it's the only safe place, right? All right, number five, last one. So when we're accepted our dual citizenship, we become subjects of it, we decide to live true to the grain of the kingdom. Then we purpose that we're going to carry the kingdom. It took me a bit of time to get here, but I had to lay the platform to get here. You see, you need to understand that you're carriers of a kingdom. You're not carriers of a good idea or a nice message. Stop that stupidity. You're carrying the kingdom of God. When you speak... And you speak from a place of submission to his kingdom, to his rule and reign. He speaks through you. You're an ambassador of a kingdom. Come on, is this, is this hitting your head? I know I'm not preaching and being funny, but you've got to get this. You're, you're, you're not just out doing something nice. You're carrying a kingdom. You're carrying a kingdom. Right now, Lord, let it just blow up inside of them. You're not, yeah. You know, in all this, in my journey to thinking about this stuff, I felt the Lord say to me personally, you know, He said to me, Andy, I didn't call you to be a church member. I called you to be a kingdom breaking out. Everywhere you go, the kingdom comes. The kingdom, remember, manifests itself and introduces itself. Now, what am I talking about? Again, similar with the vine. We're not speaking of the corporate anointing. We're talking about the resident presence. Because too many Christians live to go from meeting to meeting. And in doing that, they ignore something that's far more powerful, powerful, which is the resident presence of God. That God now lives in you. The king is in you. And if the king is in you, which we know he is, the spirit of the king is in you. His kingdom is in you. Now, this is where it gets exciting because I'm going to answer something that many of you ask, why didn't anything happen when I prayed? You may not like the answer, but it will give you something to work with. You see, operating in kingdom authority is not about volume. It's about knowing You're in the kingdom and you carry its authority. Now, people want to live lives that are no different to the lives that the people live in the world. And they want to pray and see things happen. Very rarely will it. You see, I call it the law of degree. Now, watch me. Simple. I'm I'm almost embarrassed how simple this is. To the degree you're submitted to his kingdom will determine the degree that the kingdom manifests through your life. Did you catch that? To the degree, oh, well, I'm a born-again Christian, I do this, and I pray. Why don't you get pray? Because you're not subject. You're not, you're not bowing the knee to the rule and reign of God. To the degree that you're submitted to the rule and reign of God in your life, your daily life, will determine the amount 
of authority that you walk in. Not as a pastor, not as a preacher, as a missionary, as a follower of Jesus. And I want to encourage you, get more submitted to his rule and reign than you've ever been. Be, be more knee bowed to his rule and reign. And as you do, the authority begins. See, a lot of the Pentecostals are confused by this. They think that, that volume equals success. Actually, authority is quietness and confidence. Because you know what you're carrying. And when you speak, things stop. Can I share a funny story? You're about ready for one, right? First time I cast out a demon. You can imagine, right? I knew nothing. I was a big mouth evangelist. First time I saw a dead person. Terrified me. But the Sunday before, I was on the stage going, I'll raise the dead. And I went to work for my brother-in-law and he sent me to clean the mortuary. And I went down into the preparation room and there was a customer. And all I could hear was me on the Sunday before. I'm already there. I was pathetic. I got a mop and I was like, don't let her move, Jesus. Please, Jesus. Don't let her. I'm not ready. I'll be ready, but not now. Not this one, Lord. Let us stay. I'm okay now. I'm okay now. Around that same time when I thought I knew everything, but I knew nothing. I was in a Spanish church. I think it was Austin in New York. And it was a totally Spanish church. There was a lot of witchcraft and the blue magic and all that, all that kind of stuff, you know. And I was there. The pastor was on stage. It was quite traditional. The, the elders or the deacons were on stage. Gina's sitting like where you're sitting, right? And I'm preaching a pretty good message. I've only been in ministry like a year or a year and a half or something like that. And all of a sudden, this woman, this crazed woman, leaps up from the back, definitely not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and comes rushing at me, screaming. And you know you go slow-mo, don't you? You go slow-mo, you're like... God. Uh. So she's, she's running at me. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm standing there, I'm like, that is ugly. And I spin around to see the pastor and what he's going to do. I kid not, he's hiding. <laughs> I'm spinning slow mo, and the pastor's hiding. He's terrified. The elders and the deacons are gone. I spin round here, like, she's still coming at me. And I'm like, oh no, what do I do? I'd, I'd, not, I'd not had a moment like this. This wasn't working like I thought. And all I knew was the night before in the hotel, I was watching rodeo. <laughs> now this is true, ask Gina, it's true. You know when they, they, they get the, the young cow out and they rope it up in so many seconds. It's all I had to work off. So I jump off the stage, right? <laughs> To meet her, to meet her, right, in midair, we collide. Boom, we're down. Gina's there. I'm on top of this woman. I'm spinning around. She's got, like, the strength of, like, ten people. I'm on her, and I'm spinning around. I'm getting, oh, oh, oh. I keep seeing Gina. I'm flying past Gina, and I'm like, will someone stop the ride? I'm feeling sick. And she's screaming. The pastor's hiding. Oh, you want to come out on ministry trips with me? It's fun. The deacons are hiding. They're all wondering what I'm going to do. I haven't got a clue what I'm going to do. I've never been here before. You know, you don't really see much of this in Britain. You don't. You're pretty hard to see that happen. So I'm spinning around. This is absolutely true. It's so funny, but it's true. I'm spinning around and I'm like, Gina, Gina, Gina. Gina. <laughs> and I scream at Gina, grab her feet. Okay, I'm getting sick. And so Gina grabs her feet. <laughs> and you say ministry's boring. Oh, I'm not going to go to church anymore. Being a Christian's boring. No, 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 no. Everything but. So spun, and Gina gets her feet. And I'm like, ah, ah. I totally run out of energy, you know. And then she's still flipping out. She's still going berserk. And as quiet as anything, the Holy Spirit says, why don't you speak to it? It's a good idea. We've tried. Kind of tried everything else here. So I said, 
in the name of Jesus, come out. She goes flat. It all stops. I'm exhausted. I went, well, that was easy, wasn't it? We really didn't have to go through all of that, did we? And I get her up, and she starts running around, because we went down pretty hard. She starts running around saying, I can't see. I'm like, oh, my goodness. The contact lenses had come out of her eyes when we'd hit the floor. Ding, ding, two different directions. I can't see, I can't see. So we sang a song and went home. All the way home, I'm like, hey, that was interesting, G, wasn't it, hey? 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 We'd only been married like a year. And wasn't that good? You don't need drama. You just need authority. 25 years ago, I came to, to Zambia, Livingston, 25 years ago, to work with David Hart. And I came across, then you used to land in at Vic Falls. Oh, uh, wait, Harare, Vic Falls, and then walk across the bridge to come in. Very different place, Livingston now, believe me. And uh, I, was, I was with a guy, I was standing some of the guys, I was, I was walking. Because you see, you've got to walk in the authority of God because you get no warning when things happen. It's not like, be ready in two and a half hours. All right, let me get Cheryl in the choir. Come on, girls. Hallelujah. Lift it higher. Hallelujah. I'm feeling it now. Cranking up, cranking up, cranking up. Hallelujah. I'm ready. I'm like that. You know that. You're missionaries. And I'm coming across the border, okay? Hold on, my watch is buzzing. It's probably Gina saying, stop it. No, it's not. We're okay. We're good. I'm coming across. And the guy I'm with is called Richard. And he was actually the guy who sent Pete, uh, Pete Bolan over. Richard. And uh, just to tell you, he's a real person, all right? <laughs> Shouldn't have to do that, you know? We're walking across, and we're, and we're coming across the exchange at the bridge. Without warning, he's gone, and he stops breathing on the floor in Livingston. And again, I'd only been in ministry probably two weeks longer than the last incident. <laughs> and he's on the floor, and suddenly people are saying, he's gone, he's gone. I'm like, all right, Holy Spirit, because I've learned something. I'm, I'm a quick learner. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you just need to speak with authority the word life. And, and I got on him and I just started to speak life, life, over and over again, life, life, stop breathing, life, life. I was getting a nice crowd, life, you don't see this often when you're crossing Vic Force. life, life, life. And all of a sudden, he come back. I said, later on, I said, what happened, Richard? He said, I do not know. I, you know, obviously it was demonic. We were, we were crossing. He said, all of a sudden I felt hot. And then I was falling down a dark tunnel. And he said, all of a sudden I heard your voice. Life, life, life. And your voice became a rope. And I grabbed it. And it pulled me out. See, the Holy Spirit only said that one word. Just, just say life. We've got to stop all the drama of ministry. And just realise that. We have a kingdom in us. We're citizens of a kingdom that's not far, far away. It's, it's in us. Now, again, I'm going to bring this in for a landing. Um, Romans 8 says, you know, uh, if, if you turn to Romans 8, verse 1, God has given us you know, the spirit of condemnation. All that. But it says, uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free. We need to understand that the kingdom life within us is not normal life. It raises the dead. It heals the sick. It's not everyday life that you knew in your previous citizenship. It raises the dead. It changes things. We need to believe in this time for that life that supersedes natural order. You see, Jesus always superseded natural law. He always did. People don't walk through walls. What was that? I mean, it, it's, it's just natural laws. He just superseded them because the law of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from natural laws, right? You know, dead people don't come out of the grave, Lazarus. 
They don't, especially three days. But King James tells you, they stinketh. <laughs> Be not mistaken. They stinketh three days. But Jesus stands there because he's not carrying natural laws. He's carrying the laws of his kingdom, the spirit of his kingdom. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, just think for a moment about poor Lazarus. He didn't even know he was dead because you don't think you know you're dead. You die. And, then, and all of a sudden, he's not where he died. He's, he's on a shelf wrapped up. The guy was like, what happened? You know, he's, he's in there and all he hears is, hey, Lazarus. He can't see because his face is covered. He doesn't know he's on a shelf. He's like, why can't I move? Because you've been wrapped up in, in grave clothes. But he wasn't there. He didn't see it. Can you imagine what it was like for Lazarus? And so he goes to move. Boom, falls off the shelf. <laughs> Can't see. Wrapped in glaive clothes. Like toilet rolls. It's like, what happened? What happened? And all he can hear is the voice. Oh, Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus. And so he starts making his way. I don't know if you saw the film where he comes out, right? You know, the big epic Hollywood film where he comes out like... Nothing like that. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. Read the Bible. It's rubbish. You know, when, when, when he says Lazarus, and, and, and you see, everyone's going, oh, you've got, you know, Jesus and the Marvelettes. That's what I call the disciples. So they marveled at everything that he did. So you've got Jesus and the Marvelettes. You've got, you got and, and Lazarus. No, this is, this is it. Everybody's watching the hole and they see. You say, brother, you've gone too far. Really? Because Jesus said, lose him and let him go. See, the power we carry, the power we carry, I give you all kingdom authority over every curse, over every sickness, over every disease, over every, I give you, let's just add the word kingdom, kingdom authority over all those things, over all the works of the enemy. I want to encourage you just as we close now. Let the kingdom explode in you. Wherever you're going back to on the mission field. It will be different. It will be different. It will be different. It will be different. Not because you became anything else. But you discovered the treasure. In the earthen vessel. It's the father's. Good pleasure to give you a kingdom. We're not going to go late tonight. You know the neat thing about the kingdom? It's got its own language. Every kingdom has its own language. His kingdom has its own language. Shetekara masondore patata. Shemamana sanama. Oh, I'm only speaking the language of my true kingdom. The kingdom of my second birth. I'm in it and it's in me. Would you just pray with Kalabosolaba? Kitela Maso Limatara Simatara Masondora Boboko Kiamara Masandara Babosebe Koboko. I said, just keep praying. Sikala Mosokoraba. We're nearly done. No big endings tonight. This is it. So Baraba Basiberie. We worship you, Jesus. Just begin to thank him for his kingdom in you right now. Just begin to thank him for his kingdom that's in you right now. Come on, just begin to acknowledge it. Just begin to acknowledge it. Just begin to submit to it. Come on, no drama. Just begin to say, there's a kingdom in me. Thank you, Lord. I'm a citizen of your kingdom. Your kingdom's in me, Lord. Just as you're sitting there with your eyes closed, I just want to read these verses to you as we, we finish today. Because we need to understand the plan of God is everything going back to its beginning. It always was. For years, you know, for years I thought the end of the game was when all things were subject to Jesus. It's not. He then presents them to the Father. Isn't that powerful? 
You see, the language we speak is kingdom. The language that we speak is not the kingdom of his life. Some of you are like, that's not true. I've never heard that. Listen, 1 Corinthians, just with your eyes closed, listen to this. 1 Corinthians 15. I love this verse. Let me just dig in there somewhere. All right. Verse. Hold on. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 24. Okay, here we go. This is my closing prayer, but you understand that the plan of God is everything goes back to its original design, where God was in all things, over all things, and all things were subject to him. The mission of Jesus was to bring that which wasn't of his kingdom back under the authority of his Father. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. I'd never seen that bit. In my little world, it always ended with Jesus. But it says, when everything has been brought under the rule and reign by us, we're the ones that bring everything. Our, our, our role in this, the reason you're with Overland, is to bring everything that's not under the rule and reign, every person that's not living under the rule and reign, to Jesus. But then it says, he will take all of this and he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and all the authority and the power that challenged him. For he must reign until he puts all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything's been put under him, it's clear that that does not include God himself because it's from God all things come. The God who put... Um, the God who has put everything under his Christ. When he has done this, then the Son, I love this, listen. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him. So that God may once again be all in all. The beginning of this journey starts with God the Father. God being all in all. He sent Jesus to go and gather that which was of other authority and bring it under the rule and reign. Jesus sends you as missionaries to find everything that's not of his kingdom and bring it back in. But isn't that last moment so special? But when everything is under the feet of our Jesus, our Jesus goes to the feet of the Father and says, everything you lost is now returned. And he will be in all things. He will be all things. Like it was before the apple was taken from the tree. Missionaries, let me just pray for you. For Christ has sent you out to gather that which was lost. God's Christ has sent you into the nations to find everything that hasn't experienced his kingdom. The message of the first disciples was come into the kingdom. Come, it's a better way of living. Come into the kingdom. Experience kingdom life. But there's a day in the calendar, God's calendar. But when Jesus sounds that trumpet, everything we've gathered, I love this. He then takes and says, Here you are, Father. You are once again all.
there is no authority other than you. There's an anointing here right now. God's doing stuff in people's hearts right now, in this moment. Come on, the Holy Spirit's sealing this message. I know I've taught a lot tonight, but I needed to embed this so that the kingdom wasn't something far away that you one day experience. But it's here, it's now, you are in it, and it is in you. You are carriers of a kingdom. Last night and tonight, during worship, I lifted my head with my eyes closed. And I saw a stairway. Happened last night, as clear as anything, I saw a stairway. From heaven to earth. I forgot about it. Tonight I was worshipping again. And I saw it again. A real stairway between heaven and here. I was reminded of Jacob. Jacob one night, didn't he, pulled up a rock, (laughs) went to sleep. And while he was asleep, he had a vision of a stairway. started on earth and ended in another realm and as he watched ministry was coming up and down like an escalator just coming up and down continually Jacob wakes up and he says surely the Lord was in this place And I have been totally unaware. I have been living totally unaware. But in my sleep, he enabled me to see what was real. You see, with his eyes opened, he wasn't seeing what was real. But with his eyes shut, God let him see what was going on. Stay with me. This is just coming into my heart now. Just some revelation coming in. He takes the rock... And he says, this is surely the house of God. And using cement and concrete, he establishes something on the earth that is a meeting place between heaven and earth. Then we see Jesus turning to a man that chose to follow him. He turns his name from Reed blown in the wind to the rock. You see, this time it was different. No longer was the connection between heaven and earth going to be a building, a tabernacle, or a temple made by man. Now it was going to be man himself. The church is not a building. It's a community of people called out of darkness into light. Tonight, there's a stairway that runs from the kingdom in heaven and the bottom of it is your life. Oh, but we could close our eyes and see what was going up and down. But you see, our lives are the bottom of the staircase And as we remain kingdom conscious, as it is in heaven, so it is on earth through us. I was unaware that there was a meeting point between heaven and earth missionary do you not know that you are the horizon of God the place where supernatural meets natural 
come on, you've all seen enough horizons. It's the moment where apparently the sky touches the earth. What if tonight, like Jacob, we've not been seeing as we should? But our lives are the horizon where heaven touches earth. Father, I pray right now, let them know they're carrying a kingdom. Let them know, Lord. Let them know they're not normal. Everyday people living every... No, Lord, that changed when they were born again. There's a connection. The bottom of the stairs is you. And at the top of the stairs is him. (laughs) Angels coming up and down. Ministry going up and down. Miracles coming up and down. Miracles coming up and down. It just makes you want to go and touch someone, doesn't it? eh? Doesn't it? eh? Doesn't it? eh? It's better than that whole ministry where we squeeze people's heads and push them over. This is much better. When You know, when I brush past people, I'm like, I let my branch just touch them. <laughs> I haven't got a clue what's going on. I'm just, I'm just letting the life of the vine come through the branch, you see. Get him another one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, something coming down the staircase, Phil, right now. <laughs> Ooh, Glory. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you staircase, you get to enjoy it as well. <laughs> you guys are coming into a new realm, like it was prophesied earlier, where the dead get up. <laughs> the sick are healed. And it will come from the law of degree. I promise you, I promise you, you don't get this stuff cheap. You study the people that lived in, in, the, in the miraculous. And you'll find every one of them lives that were submitted and accountable to the rule and reign of God. They didn't just go to church on Sunday. To the degree your life is submitted will determine the degree of how the kingdom comes through you, manifests, introduces itself. Exciting days. The Holy Spirit's allowing us to rediscover the things we thought we knew. Because God has an appointment with his dad. Jesus has an appointment with his father. When he collects everything we gave him, we brought in. We're going to see that. And he's going to come and say, Father, it's all back again now. The harvesters went and got it all back, Lord. Every lost child in Africa, every, they went, here it is, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. In our lives. And through our lives, as it is in heaven. 